raised this issue of why the Muslims are actually, they are screaming their guts out in the early morning by around 5, 5.30 and waking up other people through their loudspeakers for the early morning prayers. If they want to wake up their people, why do they have to use their loudspeakers? That is their question. And because of which, some of the politicians, they have actually tried to politi politicize this whole issue. You know, for whatever gains that they want to, they have tried to politicize this whole issue. I want to share my perspective in the issue of using loudspeakers and its need and its benefits. Well, there was a time in the past among the Muslim communities. When I say Muslim communities, there are various factions among the Muslims, various sects among the Muslims. Though Islam encourages people to unite on the basis of the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet wasallam, the Prophet wasallam, he said, I'm leaving two things for you. Whosoever holds on to it will not go astray. And he said it is the Quran and the Sunnah. It is the way of the Prophet And he also said uh, in various places that this Ummah, this community of the Muslims will be divided into 73 sects, 73 groups. And when he said that, the companion, he asked this question, 73 groups, okay. And the Prophet wasallam he said, out of that 73 sects, 73 groups, just one group will enter paradise. So the companion, he asked the question, which is that group which will enter paradise? So the Prophet said, Ma ana alayhi wa ashabi al -yawm. He said, it is that which I and my companions are upon it. The way of the Prophet and the companions. So out of the 73 groups in this world today, just one group will enter paradise according to the teachings of the Prophet There are so many uh, deviant sects amongst the Muslims, each one calling to their own way of life. But what as a Muslim we have to do is, written back to the Quran, as the Quran says, وَاَتَّسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold fast to the rope of Allah and be not divided amongst you. So the rope of Allah is the Quran and the Sunnah. The explanation of the this verse of the Quran is given by the the uh, the uh, Mufassirin, the people who have uh, explained the words in the light of the Hadith. They have said it is the Quran and the Sunnah because the Prophet ﷺ in another place in the Hadith he has said, "I'm leaving two things for you. Whosoever holds on to it firmly will not go astray." So coming to the topic, when it came to the issue of loudspeakers, a lot of factions among the Muslim community. They said we should not use the loudspeakers because it is bidah. It is an innovation in the religion. It is not permitted in the religion. So just about a few years ago, the Muslim community was debating whether to use the loudspeaker or not. So it is not part of our religion to say that we have to use the loudspeaker. We don't say that. But at the same time, in the matters of ibadah ghair mahda, Islam gives way for us to improvise on things wherein Allah and His Messenger have permitted to use the loudspeakers or the mic. There is no restriction in the religion. We must understand in Ibadah Mehda, there are two categories of worship which has been explained in the books of Fiqh. One is Ibadah Mehda. Ibadah Mehda is that in which your worship is directly in connection with the Creator with God. Like for example, your salah, five time prayers. It's ibadah mehda. There is no one else involved in that. You know, it's just you and God. It is ibadah mehda. With respect to dressing, with respect to dressing, though it is also part of ibadah, here something else is involved. Your culture is involved. Your, your, your preference is involved. Your, the place where you come from is involved. So in this, this is Ibadah Ghair Mehda. So in the first category, Ibadah Mehda, everything is forbidden unless and until you have the proof to perform the deed from the Quran and the Sunnah. Say for example, if somebody is praying two raka prayers in the morning Fajr Salah, whatever you have to pray, how you have to pray, what are the positions, everything is been legislated in the Quran and the Sunnah. So no one can introduce anything new 
just by his own self. You can't perform any deed unless and until you cite a proof from the Quran and the Sunnah. In Ibadah Ghair Mehda, everything's permitted for you to do unless and until you have a proof to call it as haram or forbidden. So in matters of the dressing, everything is permitted for you to wear unless and until you have the proof to call it as haram or forbidden. So this issue of mic and then the loudspeakers, all these things come under the category of ibadah ghair mahda. It is all permitted unless and until you cite proof for forbidden, for it to be forbidden. So now we come to this issue of loudspeakers. So we understand if there is benefit in the loudspeakers, we can use it. And today we are in a situation wherein the world Muslim community has acknowledged that using the microphones or the, the loudspeakers is absolutely fine. But why are we using it? Why can't we just be the prophetic way of just you know, using your vocals alone without the microphones and the loudspeakers? Well, the main purpose of using the loudspeaker is to call people to the Salah. The importance of Salah is very well expounded in the Quran and the Sunnah. The Quran, time and again, it calls people to pray the five daily prayers. The reason behind the five daily prayers is the remembrance of Allah. One of the things that which is established through Salah is the remembrance of Allah. And if a person is praying five times a day, what does he achieve? In the Salah, the Tanha and Il Fashai wal Munkar, the Quran says, the Salah helps a person to stay away from evil and obscene things. So, Salah is a reminder, it helps you to strengthen your faith, it helps you to have a connection with the Creator. And you are asking for guidance in the Salah. As the Prophet ﷺ, he said, when a person, he prays, he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heaven, he says, Habidani Abdi. My slave has praised me. And ar rahman rahim he says, so every verse that which the man, when he is offering salah, when he is reciting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heavens, he answers a believer's prayer. He says, yes, my slave has praised me and I'm going to give him what he wanted. So all of these things are mentioned in the ahadith. So salah is very important. And calling for salah is also equally important, reminding them. What happens in the... Uh, in the Adhan, we call it as Adhan, calling for Salah. The person who calls for Salah is called as the Mu'addin. Mu'addin. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said uh, in the Hadith in uh, Sahih Muslim, he said, Al-Mu'addinuna atwalun nasi anakan yawm al qiyamah He said, the callers of Adhan, the person who announces for the prayer, their necks will be the longest on the day of judgment and and the people when they look at their necks they will identify wow it's so nice it's so brilliant for them to identify and they would be identified as those who were muazzinun in the dunya they were callers for salah they were doing the righteous deed of rimam, uh, reminding the people of the salah so what is sal uh, the uh, what is the azan content basically the azan content if you say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It says, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. So you are reminded that Allah is the greatest one. Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there is no God worthy to be worshipped but Allah. Ashadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And I bear witness that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is the messenger of Allah. Hayyan al salam Come to the prayers. Hayyan al-Falah, come for success. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest, and there is no one worthy to be worshipped other than Him. So that is what a person is reminded to come for the Salah. And this reminder is not just limited to only Muslims. This invitation is for all of mankind, for all the people in the world. When they hear to the azan, they have to understand that they have to answer the call. They have to answer by getting into the masjid and offering prayers. 
Because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he came with a messenger. Uh, he came as a messenger of God Almighty, whom we call in the Arabic language as Allah. And this call is not just limited to one group of people. It's for all of mankind, for them to come and they can also worship the Creator. And the the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he also taught how to pray. So this invitation is not just limited to one group of people. It is for the entire mankind. That is one fundamental thing that I want to express. Now, there are some people, politicians, who say this is actually disturbing people in the morning hours, in the morning around five o'clock. Why do you disturb us? And the Prophet ﷺ he said, when the adhan is being recited, when the adhan is being said by the muaddin, shaitan runs away. He flees away from that place. You know, shaitan does not like the adhan. And there are people who would not like Adhan. They would find it, you know, these people, they're always worshipping God. And we don't want this to happen. We don't want people to talk about God. And there are people amongst the people in our times who actually believe that there is nothing to do with God. They feel that we should not talk about God. There are many things to talk about. Why are we even talking about God at all? So those people also, they would not like the call of Adhan. They would want to just sleep and they don't want people to remind them of the Creator. So Shaitan runs away from that place. You know, Shaitan does not like Azan being recited. So now what we understand, there is a group of people who don't like uh, being reminded of God. What I would sincerely say, if they have this as a yardstick, saying that don't disturb any human being by the loudspeakers, I would say if you say you are going to standardize this throughout India, then I'm with you. If you're going to standardize this saying that don't use loudspeakers at all, don't disturb your neighbor, don't disturb the people in your locality, I would say I'm with you if you standardize this. But if you see what happens in India most of the times is that whenever any occasion, be it Muslim or non-Muslim, of every community or even for any national festivals, you will find the loudspeakers being blasting all through in the localities, in the marketplace, sometimes in, uh, in the schools or outside the schools. You will find it it's something which is happening every day, every second. You might, you might just find it in, in India. It is not something which is just limited to one group of community. You might be knowing that in some of the non-Muslim festivals, they have certain pendals being kept and there are music systems there and they blast the sounds and it goes on all through the night and it is something which is prevalent. And I would say if you are standardizing saying that let us not use loudspeakers, I would say cut everything off. Cut everything off, not just limiting to the adhan, but you will have to cut everything off. I am also against those processions wherein some of the Muslim community members they go on procession on a Miladun Nabi, you know, on the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They take processions and they have loudspeakers and you know what they play in the loudspeakers? They play the background song of Tipu Sultan, you know, the, the serial which was very famous, the Sanjay Khan's, um, you know, the uh, serial. They play that background and they feel as though they are all uh, inheritors of uh, Tipu Sultan. I am totally against that also, you know, blasting the loudspeakers and disturbing anybody, I am totally against. Because the Prophet wasallam, he did not teach any of these things. And in the name of Islam, when you are coming across all these things, I am sure this is going to bring a bad image to the Muslims. This is exactly what is happening. Some section of the Muslim community, they do something in the name of religion, and the whole of the Muslim community are tainted by that, saying that you Muslims, you are not behaving well. So we must recall to the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, he clearly and uh, he said in the hadith, a Muslim is he who of his hands and his tongue, his neighbor is safe. You should not in any way trouble any of your neighbors, be it Muslim or a non-Muslim. We don't have any right to disturb, disturb their privacy. There are so many people who are old. There are young children who want to study for their exams. And you are blasting the loudspeakers like anything and you are disturbing. 
at least Bangalore is safe. But if you happen to go to Kolkata, you will find Kavalis in the midnight. Midnight Kavalis. Who are performing? Muslims are performing. We are against all of these things. I, being a Muslim, I'm saying we are against all of these Kavalis which are, which are performed in the late night and disturbing, disturbing the people. We are against these things. So, when, commits, when it comes to uh, the Adhan, Adhan is something which the Muslims will give. We can't say we will not give. It's not like Kavali or it is not like procession. As these processions and Kavalis are not legislated in Islam. It is not part of the Quran or, for, or the, the part of the Sunnah. But if you come to the issue of Adhan, Adhan is something which is so very important in the Muslim community. We will give the Adhan. But if you are saying you should not use the loudspeakers, then I would say standardize it. And without standardizing, if you just say that Muslims, you are the people who are creating noise, no, I don't agree with that. I really don't agree with that because it's just a matter of two minutes of Adhan. It is just a matter of two minutes of Adhan and it is a call for the prayer and the people who are going to pray, they are the people who would stay away from evil things. They will be of those who would give up alcohol. They would be of those who would give up all, all the obscene things, which that is why they are going to pray. Because they get reminded to remember the Creator and to do the deeds, deeds with uh, which God wants them to do. Alcohol is haram. They are not supposed to do uh, imbibe alcohol. So all these things would benefit the Muslim and the Muslim community, whoever participate in the prayer. Now coming to the issue, if you see in India, in India especially, so much of commotion, we have to talk about these things, especially these processions. These processions are very, very harmful and detrimental for the uh, unity of the people in India. Whenever any of these processions take, like for be it from the Muslim community or the non-Muslim community, some of the people who want to instigate violence, they take the procession towards the worship areas of other community. Say, if the Muslims are taking processions, some of the people, they want to blast the sound in front of the temples and to disturb them. Or if it is a non-Muslim who is taking the procession, he would take and uh, take the loudspeakers towards the place where the Muslims are worshipping their daily prayers. So these processions are actually utilized by those who want to create some sort of communal disharmony for whatever purpose they are doing. And for all that they do, who are the people who are going to be blamed and who are the people who are going to suffer? The people who want peace in India. I'm sure there are a lot of people among the Muslims and there are a lot of people among the non-Muslims who just want peace. They don't want to have communal hatred, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, believe me. I come across a lot of Muslims and a lot of non-Muslims who have been really promoting an idea of peace around the world. And these people are not the ones who instigate in the name of religion, taking processions and going to other religious uh, you know, worshipping area and creating a sense of hatred amongst communities. So what I would request the people of India is to say, need to talk about banning all sorts of processions. And worshipping your God, worship within the boundaries set for you. You want to worship your God, whichever God you think and you believe as God. I believe Allah to be God. If one of you wants to worship Ram or wants to worship Jesus or wants to worship any God of yours, do all your religious rites within the boundaries in a way that you don't disturb your neighbor. There is a set area for you to worship. What happens is in some of the festivals you will find the roads are being blocked, completely blocked. You know, the roads are completely blocked. You will find the loudspeakers blasting away and the neighborhood is not at peace. The children don't get to sleep. There's somebody who is a heart patient, he will have a hard time there. And in the same note, I would want to add on another thing. The Muslims, I would like to talk about the Muslims. The Muslims should have certain level of sentiments for other communities. Yeah, we should have certain level of sentiments towards other communities. Why am I telling you this? When it comes to Eid al-Adha, or it come, we call it as Bakri, we know that we have to slaughter the animal on the Bakri day. 
But nowhere did the Prophet ﷺ said, you have to slaughter it in the middle of the road. You, it's, not the, some, it's not something which is legislated in the Quran and the Sunnah. You find somebody who is a Brahmin, who is a, a you know, vegetarian altogether, and you will be slaughtering in front of him and he cannot tolerate the blood, you know, moving, gushing out of the body. This is not something from Islam. This is not something which is legislated by the Quran or the Sunnah. Now the Muslims, what they do? They don't care what happened. The road is, you know, with blood and they don't take it in a, in a proper way in a, with the etiquettes of slaughtering. There is a clear etiquette of slaughtering. The Prophet ﷺ said what to do and what not to do. You're supposed to use a very sharp knife when you slaughter. You should not take much time to slaughter. You should minimize the pain. And you should not slaughter one animal in front of another animal. The Prophet said all of these things, isn't it? The Prophet said, you are not supposed to slaughter one animal in front of another animal. And you have to do zabiha only. Zabiha meaning you have to slaughter at the neck. I mean you are slaughtering the windpipe and the uh, veins and uh, nervous connection, everything get disconnected at, at once. Some of them they may wonder, why do you slaughter in this fashion? Why do you slaughter at the neck? There is a scientific information. When a person slaughters from the neck, the animal dies without pain, with the minimum pain, rather. How does it happen? See, in our uh, body, there is something called neurons. Whenever any stimulus is being applied on the body, if, uh, if, if a mosquito is biting your finger, the neurons, they, they collect the information and take it all the way to the brain. So, if the connection to the brain is cut off, so the pain will not be felt by the brain. So the brain has to sense the pain and then the brain gives the command for showing your uh, impulse, you're showing your reaction to the stimulus. So when this connection is cut off, the animals, whatever the pain, it is not felt by the brain, the animal is supposed to die without pain. This is one of the very important reason of doing zabiha. And when we are slaughtering, we say Allahu Akbar in the name of Allah. We uh, we praise Allah, we thank Allah by saying Allah is the greatest. Bismillahi halalan takbiran Allahu Akbar. We say that and we slaughter. Why? We don't have right to take away anyone's life, even amongst the human beings or even amongst the animals. We don't have right to just kill anyone discriminately. No way. Even animals. The Prophet said, no one is being given the right to kill even a small sparrow. You know, even a small sparrow, just for hunting purpose. It is haram in Islam for hunting purpose, for target practice to use any bird. It is haram. We are not given the permission for that. You are given permission only to eat. If it is the intention to eat for your survival, then you are given permission to actually kill an animal. I would like to, I would like to tell you one uh, hadith. There was a time during the past, there was a prophet and uh, when he was there, uh, he, uh, one ant, it burned him. I'm sorry, one ant, it bit him. So that prophet, he commanded uh, all the uh, ants to be burnt. For which God Almighty sent a message saying that one ant bit you and you want to burn the entire nation which is worshipping Allah. The thing is even ants worship God Almighty. So, the Prophet who gave a command to burn all of these ants, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a revelation saying that one ant bit you, so you want to burn all the nation of the ants? Don't do that. Same thing happened with uh, the Prophet one time. When uh, he was moving by a place, the Sahaba, they found a lot of ants. They, they found uh, a small hill of ants and um, they started burning them. So the Prophet he stopped them saying that None of you has the right to burn anyone. Only God Almighty has got the right to burn in the hell, no one else. So, how to kill, how not to kill, why to kill, why not to kill, everything is explained in the Quran and the Sunnah. So the Muslims should hold on to the values and they should be very, um, uh, what to say, sensitive to the sentiments of people of other community. And same thing I would advise the non-Muslims also, non-Muslims also. When it comes to the matters of, you know, Diwali, 
Diwali, you practice whatever you want to do. You think that burning crackers is your right and it is registered in your religion. I would not question you. I, I have no right to question you. But it has to be within your boundaries. You know, if you are bursting cracker, it should not come into my home. Your crackers should not burn your neighbor's home. And the smell that comes out of your cracker should not come into my home. You know, people who are suffering from bronchitis, they're, they're almost in the verge of death. The moment they inhale the crackers, uh, you know, the smell coming out of the crackers, it could uh, prove detrimental to them. So we have to be sensitive. We are, as a pluralistic society, we all have to live in a way that you, each one of us, we have our own right in a way that we don't actually hamper the other person's right. As one of the great thinkers in the past, he said, my freedom to swing my arms ends at a place where the other person's nose begins. So you have all freedom to swing your arms. I have no, I can't question you. But when it comes to my nose, when it comes very close to my nose, then you have to watch me. So with that attitude, if we are having a debate on the issue of loudspeakers, inshallah, ta'ala, loudspeakers we can understand. We can really truly understand if somebody is being disturbed in the early hours. Fine, we can even think of other ways of curbing this problem. Probably we can have a very uh, less sound and we can do it in such a way that it doesn't harm anybody else. But I would at the same time tell the Muslims, just because you can use the loudspeakers, it doesn't mean you can use it for kawalis. It doesn't mean that you can do it for the late night worship of yours. You singing nath and you doing all that. Some of them, they even have the loudspeakers, you know, in the month of Ramadan sometime. They are actually praying in the night, one o'clock, two o'clock, and they are crying. They are literally crying and they want the whole of the locality to hear. Why do you want that to happen? Is it legislated in Islam? No. So why do you want that to happen? So please be very sensitive to the people of other communities and let us do a thing which is reasonable and which is something which is appreciated by our creator. Yeah.